All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Kylie, and I am an outreach specialist with the Coconut Rhinoceros Beetle Response. And my name is Koki, another outreach specialist with the CRB Response. So today we're going to be talking about um, coconut rhinoceros beetle and how they cause damage to palms. I um, just want to start off by saying thank you to Smart Trees Pacific uh, for prompting us to do our first webinar. Um, and without further ado, we'll get into some of some more information about CRB. So this is a coconut rhinoceros beetle. We commonly refer to it as CRB since coconut rhinoceros beetle is such a mouthful. Um, it is a two inch to two and a half inch large black beetle um, native to Southeast Asia. Um, and this is an invasive pest in Hawaii that we are working to stop the spread of. Um, so what is a CRB? This uh, image shows a bit of its life cycle. Um, they start off as eggs, um, mostly found in mulch and decomposing plant material. Uh, they move through three larval instars, which is indicated by the size of the head capsule, and they can reach up to three inches in length once, they, once they're at their third larval instar. Um, similar to a butterfly, they pupate and then emerge as adult beetles. And this is when they become a problem. They feed primarily on palms and other tropical crops. Um, like I mentioned before, they can reach two to two and a half inches in length. They're a solid black color, which um, when we get to some lookalike species uh, can be one way to help identify them. They have a prominent horn and strong arms that help them to burrow through uh, palm uh, spears and the heart of the palm. Uh, we know that they can fly up to two miles at a time and they are nocturnal. Um, we assume that they're slightly lazier beetles though. If they have good material to breed in and something to feed on, then they don't typically fly that full two mile length. All right, so some other Lookalike species, uh, one of the most common uh, reports that we get is of oriental flower beetles. So that's that beetle that's in the middle. It is also a non-native pest species, but this is a really widespread pest. Um, they feed primarily on rotting fruit, um, but they do breed in the same material as CRB. So if you find oriental flower beetle larvae, uh, know that there could potentially be coconut rhinoceros beetle larvae mixed in there as well. Uh, dung beetles also look really similar to coconut rhinoceros beetles. They're black and have that horn, uh, but they're significantly smaller and are beneficial to the decom decomposition process. Um, so what we're really looking for is the coconut rhinoceros beetle which like I mentioned is an invasive species here in Hawaii that feeds on all sorts of palms and we'll go into a bit more about uh, palm damage and biology. And, um, but they also can feed on other tropical plants. Um, we've noticed damage here in Hawaii on hala, sugarcane, kalo, and banana. Um, and they are a target species of our response. So the coconut rhinoceros beetle response was established in February of 2014. That's when um, you can see the start of this graph here. It was first detected at Mamala Bay Golf Course on Oahu in uh, December of 2013. So the response kind of started quickly after that. Um, this graph shows all of the trap detections that we've had since the start of our program. Uh, what you can notice in the last few months of the program, we have seen an increase in trap catches, um, and that's something that's alarming to us. Uh, some of that can be attributed to lack of access to certain traps um, in catching CRB uh, because of COVID, but we do notice that there is an increase in um, detections island-wide. And this is a heat map that shows where those catches are being found. 
Um, so yellow indicates a higher catch area with uh, blue being areas where we catch periodically. Um, our highest catch area is Pearl City Peninsula. So that's indicated in that yellow circle kind of in the middle of the map. Um, other areas of concern for us include Iroquois Point, which is below that there. Thanks, Koki, for doing the mouse there. Um, Waipio Peninsula is also an area of concern for us. And then we're starting to see some encroaching uh, population into Mililani, Ag Park, Punia, Loa Ridge Farm area, and then some into Eva Beach. Um, Occasionally, we do find catches out in the west side or Pupukea. Uh, when we find those, those outlier areas or outlier catches, as we call them, we attribute that mainly to the movement of green waste, meaning that it's human vector, um, and hopefully not the establish, an established breeding population. Um, so we're very thankful that uh, coconut rhinoceros beetle was first introduced on the leeward side of the island, so drier, warmer conditions. Um, because if we had seen CRB on the other side, then it would be a bit of a different story. Um, so we're thankful that we've been able to contain it as a program to some of these drier areas as well. But we definitely need help to continue to uh, contain the spread. <laughs> um, so now we'll get into a little bit about parts of a palm tree and some more scientific evidence of CRB damage. Um, so this may be a review for some of our citizen foresters here who are uh, plant experts or tree experts, um, but just kind of going over a bit of the parts of a palm of, or parts of a palm tree. That's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, we can see the trunk that's kind of that main structure that helps to support the palm. It extends from the roots to the first growth of, which could be a, a frond or an inflorescence. Um, then we have the crown, and that is the growing part of the tree that extends from the first growth to the top of the tree. So those are some of the two main sections of the palm. Um, so you'll hear us referring to the crown um, or the trunk or the frond, which is the leaf of the palm. Um, inflorescence is the reproductive tissue of the palm. So inflores inflorescence meaning like the flowers. Um, and then they will, uh, once they're pollinated, they'll mature into coconuts, dates, beetle nuts, etc. in a palm or whatever the fruit may be. And then the spear. So you'll hear us mentioning the spear a lot throughout this presentation. That is the primary target of the coconut rhinoceros beetle. And that is the tightly bundled unemerged leaves that um, house all of those, those leaves of the uh, palm before they emerge. Um, so then looking at some different different types of palm fronds. On the left, we have a pinnate leaf. Um, the rachis extends throughout the, the length of the palm, or of, of the frond, sorry. Um, sometimes we also refer to that as the midrib. Um, the leaf sheath is at the bottom. That's the part that kind of holds it onto the trunk. And then we have leaflets, um, which sometimes are referred to as just the leaves of the palm frond as well. And then we also have palmate leaves and um, similar structure. Another way to remember this is a palmate leaf uh, is commonly referred to as a fan palm, with a pinnate leaf being referred to sometimes as a feather palm. Um, and you can kind of distinguish those two based on the way that they uh, they look. Um, so how do palms grow? Uh, for coconut palms, and this is a, a bit of a reference to an older bit of research, uh, the number of scars on the stem divided by 13 gives the approximate age of the palm in years. So that means that one new palm frond emerges ab about every month. And uh, knowing that, of information, and this refers to coconut palms specifically, 
uh, that's one way that we can track damage over time and estimate when a feeding event may have occurred. Um, so Koki kind of cycled through some of the growing pattern of how the fronds emerge, um, but basically they emerge um, at 140 40 degrees offset from the last frond. So um, we're kind of seeing like an unfurl in an even pattern over time. And then we have a short video that kind of shows, um, that demonstrates how the, the fronds um, unfurl over time as well. <laughs> I really like this video because of all the, the uh, time you can see passing around everything but the um, coconut that's growing. Um, but hopefully that helps to kind of demonstrate what we mean in how the leaves are emerging at a specific type of pattern and how all of this information helps us to determine um, success over the program when we're doing tree surveys and hopefully will help to inform um, your efforts as citizen foresters as you're out there um, looking at trees and assessing damage. So talking about the spear, um, like I mentioned, all of the de undeveloped fronds are bundled together in one structure called the spear. Um, so we have this little cutout here that, that helps to demonstrate that. Um, the spear consists of several immature fronds at different sizes held together in the center of the crown. Um, so some of the real life photos that we have in the next coming slides will show how they're all packed together. Um, and it takes about 20 months for a frond to grow from a lump of cells so that the most or the, the newest, freshest, unemerged palm frond um, all the way up until it emerges can take up to 20 months, which is, um, like I said before, really important in helping us to determine uh, palm health and, and when a feeding event may have occurred. All right, so then looking at this, um, this is how the immature fronds are bundled together within the spear. Um, you can see the, uh, the rachis of the palm frond in the middle and then of all of the unemerged leaflets all kind of pressed together. Um, so when we talk about damage, um, and we'll see that in the next slide, uh, what they're doing is feeding on this uh, juicy inner spear. And um, the way that they're digging in uh, translates to a specific type of damage that we see when the leaves emerge. Um, and the positioning of the borehole is what helps to uh, determine where we see those V cuts and the extent or how deep and um, severe those cuts are. So as it's uh, knowing that that inner part, kind of thinking back to that last slide where the, the midrib or the rachis is of the palm um, compared to where the leaves are, we, and um, knowing if a beetle travels through the palm at that specific location, um, then we're gonna start to see the leaves once they emerge have the uh, distinct V-shaped cuts, which, which Koki will go into a bit as well throughout the presentation. Um, so these are some real life photos that we have of uh, beetles boring into the spear. Um, so what they'll do is kind of wedge themselves in between the spear and um, the leaf sheath and start to burrow their way through with their strong arms and their horn. Um, if you look really closely in this photo, you can see a beetle actually in the middle of this uh, damage to the spear. The next slide, Koki, thank you. Um, this is actually another photo taken of the spear um, 
we just so happen to cut the spear directly, <laughs> um, slicing it open to, to assess the damage and found a beetle lying perfectly in between there. So that's how they kind of um, enter, this, enter the spear and then they wedge themselves through um, at a specific angle. Next slide. And then this is what it looks like if you if you peel that apart, you'll see that borehole damage um, in the middle there, and then they are wedging themselves through that spear to get to the, the juicy innermost part. Um, so we really like this, this little diagram because it uh, really clearly shows how that damage or how that feeding event translates into real world damage. So say the borehole um, is, occurs at uh, this left side of the palm frond um, in the unemerged leaflets. What we see when that uh, leaf unfurls is this V cut shape. Um, yeah, thank you, Koki. <laughs> exactly, right over there. Um, and then if it occurs on the other side, we may see damage on the other side. So that kind of shows like they're digging through and then um, eating through what those leaflets would have been. Um, and then we're missing leaflets once the, they emerge. Uh, what's really common though is that third picture of damage. Um, most times they're actually traveling through both sides of the leaflets um, and and generally avoiding that midrib or the rickus. And we see uh, parallel V-shaped cuts as the leaf emerges. Um, so that's uh, the most common one to look out for. Um, some of the other types of damage we may attribute to other things, which Koki will get into a bit uh, when we're talking about some lookalike damage. Um, and then of course, if they do travel through that midrib, then we get a clear cut at the top. Um, but one thing to note is that all of the cuts and the damage that we're seeing is at that 45 degree angle. Um, so I hope that that helps to um, paint the bigger picture of why we're seeing that specific type of damage in the um, emerged palm fronds and helps you to understand that all of this damage that we're seeing occurs before the fronds are even emerging. And Koki will get into some um, similar looking damage from uh, coconut rhinoceros beetle and then other look-alike things. Nice, thanks Kylie. So that's the theory and um, this next section is going to cover um, some pictures of things that we've seen in the field, um, which you as citizen foresters or maybe out, um, you know, just on a walk or anything you can keep an eye out for. So going into that, um, this is a sign of um, what Kylie was describing with the beetle burrowing into that innermost sphere in the frond or in the crown of the palms. So these boreholes, and if you can see my video here, we've got an example of kind of the size reference of how these look. This is where the beetle has entered um, a outer sphere and is trying to get to that innermost sphere. And then what's left behind is about a two inch borehole around the same size as a beetle. And this compared to the other signs of damage is something that's pretty telltale coconut rhinoceros beetle causes. We don't see other things um, showing this damage, but since it is occurring at the crown of a palm, it's a little bit harder to observe this smaller hole. But you can see kind of how it looks in that um, closer section of where the fronds are starting to emerge from the trunk of a palm. So we're looking at uh, three boreholes. This one might be caused by something else, but definitely these um, coconut rhinoceros beetle damage. And then so real life example of how that looks when the borehole emerges. So um, this is a frond that was damaged by coconut rhinoceros beetle early um, when it was inside the crown. And then uh, once those leaflets unfurl, because of their pattern of um, being close together, it'll show this 45 degree angle cut. So you can see uh, quite a bit of damage on um, this tree, multiple V cuts on multiple fronds, and then some of the variation too with, for example, this frond, um, the rachis was damaged as well. So you don't see any continued growth of the frond past there. 
Another thing to look for if you have a fallen frond is the scalloped or U-shaped edges. So when the beetle bores into um, the unemerged frond, it does have that same oval pattern. So when that attacks the leaflets, um, each of those leaflets will have a scalloped edge. So we'll go into some other things that can cause a 45 degree cut, but without that scalloped edge, it's less likely that it's caused by coconut rhinoceros beetle. Here's another example of scalloped edges. And um, this occurs on um, both the fan palm style as well as the more feather palm structure. And looking at some more damage, um, sometimes on fan palms especially, you can see that there's a snowflake effect with how the damage occurs. So this didn't cut across um, the entire like rest of the leaf on this fan palm, only on the one side. And then Kylie's showing a demonstration a paper cutout. So if you've ever made a paper snowflake, then this might be familiar to you, um, where the same cutout is shown on each part of the leaflet. Here's another photo to show uh, multiple damage events on the same leaf. Okay, here's an opportunity to test how many V cuts you can count on this palm um, and we'll go through so you can just keep an eye out for an estimate how many there might be and then we'll count. So eight is what was measured um, when our team was surveying this tree. Um, which is definitely something that the coconut rhinoceros beetle response does regularly, especially in our high catch areas, um, trying to keep an eye out for signs of damage. Um, if you remember back to the slide Kylie was talking about with when damage occurs, damage isn't going to be on the fronds until several months after the initial damage event happens. So we have to keep that in mind when we're considering the timing of when CRB were in the area. So a lot of the damage that can look similar um, is actually caused by things other than coconut rhinoceros beetle. So we'll just go through an, a few examples of things that you might see in the field that are actually not CRB. This one. So when you see palms positioned close to electrical wires, um, as a safety feature, a lot of the times um, trimmers will remove the fronds that are encroaching upon the electrical wire path. So near these power lines, um, we can see that the fronds are cut off but they're cut in straight lines. So these were likely trimmed um, after the fronds had emerged and rather than when they were um, in the unemerged sphere. So we'll call this trimmer damage. Another example, these uneven chew marks and kind of cuts. Um, remember the CRB causes that straight, you know, typical 45 degree angled cut because of its damage to first the crown of the tree, that innermost sphere. So something like this with irregular damage, um, we would consider uh, likely rat damage. So a rat coming to chew along the midrib there. And especially to keep in mind, um, if this happens uh, next to other taller trees, then that could give rats an opportunity to jump on to the palm. Um, and then if you see evidence of rat bands, that's another sign that rats may be in the area. Um, and if there's no neighboring trees by it that, uh, or another access point for rats to get to the crown of the palm, um, then could be something of concern if it does have those 45 degree angle cuts. Some other damage signs, so kind of this tattered leaf. Over here, again, it's not that 45 degree cut that we see with CRB, but a chew damage. This may be caused by the coconut leaf roller, which is an endemic moth that attacks coconut trees. And then some other, other damage uh, symptoms and situations that you might run into is uh, keeping an eye out for the surroundings. So um, definitely palm transplants are something that we see a lot. So this, we see a shorter tree, um, straight cuts all the way atop um, of the crown and cut at the same length. This might be caused by, yeah, a transplant. So being, being brought in for construction and just trimming those top fronds for ease of transport. Um, so definitely something that our team keeps an eye out for when doing damage surveys is what's around. 
And then um, something that could happen here too is if the inner spear is damaged, cut straight across, then later on when these transplant trees grow a bit more, they might show those V-cut damage because if that uh, innermost spear is cut in the same, you know, straight across way that the coconut rhinoceros beetle might, then we could still see the V-cuts. But at that point, it would be good to keep an eye out for those scalloped edges or boreholes as evidence of CRB. Some other things, so hooked leaflets could be caused by a nutrient or water deficiency or maybe virus, a lot of other things that, um, you know, we're really looking for those 45 degree cuts for CRB. Same deal with the accordion style of leaflets. Um, CRB will not cause this type of damage. And then one more example here, you can see that these leaflets are kind of sticking together. And again, that's not something that coconut rhinoceros beetle will cause. Um, and here we only see one tree showing symptoms. Um, so keeping an eye out for nutrient levels and water levels for trees like this um, and other, other causes for this symptom rather than CRB. So this one, a little bit of a trick question. We've got some different things going on. Um, so we do kind of see something like a 45 degree cut um, and we sort of see scalloped leaflets here, but also some bent leaflets and then this sort of uneven damage. So it could be that multiple things are going on with this palm, um, but definitely something that we want to be aware of and continue to monitor, um, maybe even looking for boreholes or other signs of damage in the area. And some more pictures of damage from out in the field. This one, you can really see how some of these got the midrib cut, others did not. And now we're gonna go into some other palm species and talk about what's at risk for um, if the coconut rhinoceros beetle does spread um, further than it already has. So off to you, Kylie. Thanks, Koki. Um, so next slide, we'll kind of go into um, what to look for when you're identifying palms. So, uh, most things that help us to identify it could be the type of frond. So going back to, is it a palmate, pinnate, sand palm, or feather palm? Um, what is the orientation of the leaflet? How long are they? How many leaflets are um, on each frond? Are there spikes on the fronds? Um, so really paying attention and looking closely to um, each of these different things. Um, looking at the trunk, uh, what is the width of the trunk relative to the height? Uh, when we go into each specific type, sometimes the trunk is the best way to help identify. Um, what is the color of the, of the trunk? Are there any leaf scars that we notice? Um, is there a prominent leaf sheath? And what color is that leaf sheath? Um, and then what do the fruit look like? Uh, oftentimes for plant identification, the best way to tell is by the fruit. Uh, so does it have coconuts? Are there dates? Um, manila palm have, have bright red fruit and every uh, type of palm kind of displays fruit in different ways. And, um, you know, sometimes it's not always visible. So really relying on all the pieces of the puzzle to help us identify uh, what that species might be. So now we'll talk about what are some of the common CRB food sources. And it's important to note here that while these are the um, most likely species that the coconut rhinoceros beetle are eating, we have observed um, some irregularities in their diet um, out in the real world. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you are really seeing something that you think might be coconut rhinoceros beetle, don't automatically write it off because it's not the right species. Uh, definitely send us a photo and we can help identify or continue to monitor that plant um, if it may be a, an issue. Um, so coconut rhinoceros beetle, coconut is in its name. Um, coconut is the primary food source. So this is just some photos of coconut trees. Um, next slide, Koki. But we also see damage caused on our native lolu. So this is a prochardia of fan palm. Um, you know, talking about uh, 
pinnate leaf versus a palmate leaf. This is the palmate leaf. Um, and this is just an example that helps to uh, show what this type of species looks like. Um, and this is something that is a target of coconut rhinoceros beetle and definitely causes us concern because our native Pritchardia are endangered. Um, so we also observe damage on phoenix or date palms. Um, some of our funding comes from outside sources in the US because there is a huge date palm industry there. And if the coconut rhinoceros beetle were to escape from Hawaii and make it there, um, that wouldn't be very good for the date palm industry. So we're really working to help protect not only Hawaii, but worldwide um, palm species and industries. Um, so date palms, and they have those really strong spikes that you can see in that photo. Thanks, Koki, for going back for that one. And then another common food source is royal palms. Uh, the main way to distinguish a royal palm is, uh, one, its height. Uh, royal palms are some of the largest types of palms that you'll see. Um, they also have a bright green leaf sheath, uh, which you can kind of see in that photo to the right. Um, so talking about the, the trunk again, the leaf sheath is that um, upper green part where all of the leaves are attaching to the trunk. And then some uncommon food sources. So definitely not saying that a coconut rhinoceros beetle is never going to eat any of these palm species, but we have not observed damage on these types of palms. So um, areca palms are really popular landscaping palms, um, manila palms as well, uh, which can also look pretty similar to royal palms. Um, the main difference there being that manila palms are usually a lot smaller and the fruit are very different. So, you know, picking apart all of those pieces of the puzzle, sometimes when you're looking at tons of palms, they all kind of start to look the same. Um, but thinking really deeply about what do the fronds look like? Do I notice any fruit? What do the fruit look like? Um, and what is the, the, um, the structure of the trunk? And then uh, there's also bottle palms. So those have a really distinct um, enlarged trunk area um, and can be identified that way. Next slide. So triangle palm and traveler's palm can look kind of similar. Um, traveler's palms are not actual palms. Um, I believe they are a type of Heliconia, I'm, I may be mistaken on that, um, closer related to bird of paradise, and uh, triangle palms, which are, are very different looking types of palms. Um, they look similar to each other, but they are not common food sources for the coconut rhinoceros beetle. And then we have cycads. Um, cycads look palm-like, but they are not related to palm species. Um, they have a, a large pine cone looking structure in the middle. Um, so that's one way that you can kind of help to distinguish that one. Um, I would say they probably look most similar to a date palm and have a lot of those similar spikes and uh, similar looking leaves, but you're really looking for that inner uh, pine cone structure to help distinguish a cycad. Um, one thing to note is that a uh, possible host shift has been um, identified in Guam. They have a lot of native cycads and um, because all of their coconut trees are in um, sharp decline, we have seen a coconut rhinoceros beetle actually feeding on the endemic cycads to Guam. So this is something of concern and also helps to indicate that um, coconut rhinoceros beetle are not host specific species. They will feed on whatever's available. So it's important to know that uh, when you're looking for damage, you know, don't discredit the uh, damage just because it's on the wrong type of palm. Um, if there's anything that you're unsure of, definitely reach out to us and we'll help to identify that. And then last slide. 
So um, action items for you as citizen foresters, definitely report anything that's suspicious to us. Um, take note of where you are and gather photos if possible. Um, you can email us or give us a call. Our info is listed right there. And um, thank you guys so much for joining us. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them for you.